so I'm ready to be done talking and turn it over to Karen. Um, but I'm really excited to introduce her briefly. I'm, I'm so thrilled always uh, to get to hear from our authors. Uh, it is such a blessing to hear from the people that have um, poured their time, energy, and love uh, into their craft, into writing a book that we get the honor to publish. Uh, and, and Karen Moore uh, is one of those people. She is the um, author, co-author of our Latin Alive uh, series. And she has also uh, authored the Latin for Children, History Readers, uh, and the Latin for Teachers course for Classical Academic Press. And Karen has been involved um, with teaching Latin for over 20 years and began studying Latin, I think, in about seventh grade. So this is, uh, this is when we talk about a veteran Latin author and educator, uh, Karen Moore fits the bill. And uh, I'm going to hand it over to her now uh, to take us into uh, the topic of upper school Latin and the series of Latin Alive. So thanks for being here with us today, Karen, and take it away from here. Thank you so much, Joseph, for that kind introduction. Thanks to all of you for taking time out of your day, wherever you are, all across this nation and perhaps beyond, for um, investing in this time to learn more about how to educate your child, maybe how to educate yourself. It is certainly, I think, um, one of, if not the greatest um, charge that the Lord gave us. So if you will um, join me, I'm just going to ask a, a brief, brief word of prayer, and then we'll get started with a um, jam-packed session. So Lord, I thank you so much for each one who's dialed in. I thank you that through modern technology, we can still have this real fellowship, this real dialogue, even in a virtual setting. I pray that you would just bless this time. I pray that you would help me to communicate well and articulately um, the, the interests or to speak to the interest that each one is coming today to talk about how we as parents, how we as teachers can really seek to educate our child um, with a long term goal as to how to raise them up for the plan that you have and the purpose you have called them to. So bless this time, Lord, and please give us favor, Lord, with all of um, the technological intricacies. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, again, thank you all for joining me. So. I've, I've got a lot to talk about in 30 minutes, and anybody who knows me knows I could talk for you know, like 100 times that on, on this subject of Latin. It's one of my, my favorite subjects. Um, as Joe mentioned, I started taking Latin in seventh grade. Some of you who've heard me talk before may know that that was not my choice. Um, it was, you could either say my mother forced me into it, or you could say it was divine providence. My mother appreciates it if I say the latter rather than the former, so we'll go with that one. But essentially, um, I filled out my choice sheet for school, for language, and I put French first because I was going to be a classical ballerina. I put German second because I have family who's German, and I put Latin third because my mother just insisted it would be so good for me if I did so. Well, my choice sheet was lost, lost in the system. And two weeks before the first day of school, I had to fill out another one. Well, the French class was full, the German class didn't make, so there I sat on the first day of Latin class thinking, I don't want to be here. Um, which is probably not a great way to talk about selling Latin, but, but it's true. Um, however, I had an amazing teacher and I just fell in love with the language very quickly. And to the extent that um, I studied it all through seventh grade, all through high school to 12th grade, and then I went to, to the University of Texas at Austin as a classics major, and Latin wasn't enough, I picked up Greek too. So this is certainly something that I'm passionate about, but I'm also passionate about it, not just because it's something I enjoy and I do, but it's because something, it's something I've seen great value and benefit in. And the passions, the joys, the benefits are all things that I poured into creating this text. So I want to try my best to articulate those and part those to you today so you can get a real feel for what is in this series, but also why it is that these things that are in this series and why is that classical language as a study can be so beneficial for all of your students, for all of your children in the upper school. And so I'm going to jump right in to my handy dandy little slideshow that um, Joseph mentioned I had um, about the Latin Alive series. 
Now, as um, Joseph mentioned, I, before I wrote Latin Alive, I actually uh, wrote, served as an advisor and editor of sorts in the um, creation of the Latin for Children series, as I was one of the beta testers. And that led to writing the Libellus de Historia, the History Reader series. And about the time I finished that series, Dr. Perrin contacted me and said, Karen, we are having um, just a great success with our Latin for Children program. People are really enjoying it. And we are getting many, many requests to create a middle high school series that could complement that. That could be some place for, for people to go after Latin for Children. And he asked me if I would be interested in writing, for, in writing that. Well, at the time, my three children um, were all in grammar school. So I said, yes, but given the fact that I'm also a full-time mom and I'm teaching at Grace Academy, I would like to have a co-author and I handpicked Galen DuBose, who'd been um, one of my mentors, um, was just a wealth, a font of, of information and understanding in Latin literature. So the two of us teamed up together to write this series. And I wanna speak just for a moment before I get into the slideshow about the vision for this series, because I think that's really important because when Dr. Perrin asked me to write this, he was looking for something first that would complement Latin for children. So that if you had done that series, this would be a natural place to go next. Second, because classical academic press is focused on classical education and classical Christian education, he wanted it to be something that would complement that kind of study. And there just were not many curricula on the market for that at this point in time when we first started this project. In many cases, um, we were going to, we meaning Latin teachers, um, we were going to other sources, um, an Ecce Romani, a Cambridge, a Ginny's, but the textbooks that were used in um, general education which were not bad texts. They had, they had pros and cons like everything does, but we wanted to do something that would tailor made, that was tailor made for classical Christian education. And so as Galen and I started to talk about this, um, one of the, some of the things that came up were um, number one, we want the language course obviously to complement Latin for children, um, but two, how we make it integrate with classical Christian education. Um, one thing we looked at was the particular approach to teaching. Um, we know that many of you who are in classical Christian education are looking at um, English grammar programs such as Shirley Grammar, right? Um, which does a wonderful job of breaking down and helping us think through our own English language. So we wanted it to complement something that with that parts to whole approach. At the same time, um, we also knew that a lot of those older parts to whole texts really didn't address the um, desire, the need, the interest, and the benefit of really bringing in oral Latin and spoken Latin, so which can sometimes be intimidating for a novice teacher. So we wanted to have some elements of that come in in a friendly way as well. So we wanted to integrate those two approaches. Um, one of the, my favorite facets about classical education, both as a teacher and as a parent, is the idea of the integrated whole to know that subjects aren't their own pigeonhole subject has nothing to do with anything else, but to see how all these things come and line up together. So I really wanted to bring that into my, and to be honest with all of you, I fell in love with Latin, um, not because I like grammar so much, although I have come to really enjoy it, but because I was fascinated by the history and the literature of the Roman people. And then to realize too, the breadth of time that Rome and then really even Latin itself beyond that was really the lingua franca and was really infiltrating everything was just fascinating to me. So I felt that as that had captured my interest, I could see it capture the interests of students. So you will see a lot of integration with a history and also with literature. And I'm gonna talk more about that towards the end. And then also with culture too. It's, I don't think you can rightly study any language, modern or ancient, without studying the facets of the culture in which it was spoken, because that's what flavors it. So um, that's kind of the background of how that came together and, and what the vision and the goal of creating this text would be. Um, 
to circle back to the first thing, the idea was to create a text where if a student had completed Latin for children, A, B, C, those three primers, and I know um, Joseph said that Dr. Perrin will be talking about that more later. The idea was that if they are a really strong student, they could jump into Latin Alive Book 2. However, Latin Alive Book 1 has enough review of the primers, but also some new approaches because we realize that in the upper school, students learn differently. They want to be challenged differently. They can understand things more deeply. So in the same instance where we might talk about George Washington and the founding fathers of our country in first grade to one degree, but we certainly want to study them again in sixth grade or ninth grade or 12th grade to a great, greater level, so we felt we wanted to certainly circle back on things learned in Latin for children that go to a deeper level with them um, in terms of reading, but also in terms of understanding how the language works too. So that's kind of the overall mindset behind this series. Um, the next thing I thought I would do is go ahead and walk through um, some chap, well, a chapter to show you some of the features that we've put into this text to help realize that vision. So that's what I'm gonna go through next. Okay, let's see, we can get this, to, there we go. All right, so I'm gonna move all of your faces out of my screen. So here we're gonna go through a chapter lesson plan because I know a frequent question for this program that I, I get is, Karen, how would you teach through a chapter? How would you approach a chapter? So I'm gonna kind of do two things at once. Highlight some of the features that accomplish these goals that I stated at the beginning um, as well as give some practical approaches to this. So one thing that I believe is true of teenagers, and I don't mean this in a critical sense, just as an observational sense as a mother who, by the way, my children now are 23, 21, and 19, um, and who's taught you know, for 20 years, so lots of observation opportunities, is that they are the most interested and the most motivated to learn something when they can see the benefit and the connection to themselves and to their lives. Um, it, it's particularly that they start out as babies being very egocentric and they're constantly kind of growing and maturing out from that. So I really like to bring things into my classroom and put things into this book that say, hey, here's where Latin relates to you today in your life. And one of the places I did that is right here at the beginning of every chapter with the chapter motto. In Latin Alive Book 1, they are the state mottos. 24 of our states have a Latin motto. And oftentimes, those mottos are derived from authentic sources, original Latin sources, such as Virgil or Cicero. Um, I think Horace uh, might have one also. Sometimes they're actually from the Vulgate Bible, too. So it's a really fascinating way to see what the founders of our country or the founders of these states and territories were thinking and what their background might have been um, as they were founding our country. And I, I bring this point in to try to drive home to students, guys, um, this isn't just some old, dead, rusty language that has no relevance to us. It has a lot of relevance and it helps us understand our modern American culture better if we can see where it came from. So I like putting these in here. Um, the other thing about these mottos, I'm going to try to blow this up, um, increase this, is that a lot of times in the state seals themselves, there's a lot of classical imagery. And when you purchase the Latin Alive Teacher's Edition, you will get further explanations on these seals, such as the images within them. For example, um, this motto, Arkansas, Regnat Populus, the people rule, um, it's Maybe a little bit hard to see here, but um, you actually have Lady Liberty right here in the, the left of the, I guess my cursor is not working. Oh, there's my cursor. Um, Lady Liberty over here on the left, but in the back, I'm sorry, that's, um, that's not Lady Liberty. Liberty Liberty's right here. In the back, you see a woman holding a pole and she has a little cap on that pole. And you actually see this pole with this cap in many of our state seals. Um, this is actually called the Phoenician cap, also known as the Liberty cap. 
In the ancient world, this Phoenician cap over in the east was a sign of someone being a free man, having their own freedom and their own liberty. In the French Revolution, the French Revolution mascot, Marianne, is actually wearing this cap. And so in the US, you see a lot of states that have this cap. So it's, an, it's again, this classical ancient symbol that's carried on over. So again, I think these things are just a great way to introduce a new chapter, to break some ice. Um, a lot of times these mottos also appear on license plates on the state quarter collection, on the sides of U.S. battleships. So it's also a great opportunity to encourage students and say, hey, where can you find this? Look for it. Start looking around you and you'll see more Latin than you realize is there. Okay, so um, the next phase we always have is the vocabulary section of the chapter. And as I go through this section, I'm always highlighting derivatives. And I do this for a couple of reasons. First of all, I feel like these are great mnemonic devices to help me, they helped me as a student, to help students remember what the Latin word means. But it's also reinforcing the idea of helping students apply their Latin learning to their English reading skills. I have found that oftentimes I can teach a student a lot of words, but if I don't show them how to make the connections between the Latin and the English, it sometimes doesn't always make, that connection does not always happen. So I really like having the derivatives here and making that a part of our introduction to vocabulary. Um, let me say a, a, a word about exercise one too. Exercise one for each chapter is often talking about recognizing the syllabication and accent of a word. And I've had different teachers ask me, do you do that every time? Do we do it always? What's the importance of that? Um, I'm gonna talk about this proposition, uh, throughout this presentation about the long game, right? So not in terms of what do I get out of Latin today? What do I get out of Latin in this book? But what do I, especially I as a teenager, as an upper school student, get out of Latin in the long game, in the long run? And to have this idea of learning how to pronounce words properly, um, if they're going to continue, and I'm going to try to convince you to continue into upper levels of Latin, you'll be reading poetry and it becomes very important then too. Um, but it's another great way to just reinforce vocabulary and whatever you choose to do, flashcards, syllabication, accent, story writing, uh, to reinforce that vocabulary is always very important. Okay, so here we go. All right, um, you will also notice that this book is divided into sections. And here we have section 21 is on adjectives, section 22 is agreement. I liked breaking it up into sections. You know, as, as Gail and I wrote this book, it was kind of fun because we're constantly talking about all the different textbooks we've used what we liked in this particular book or that particular book, what we thought we could do better. And so we were trying to glean the best of everything to put into the Latin Alive series. Um, one thing I really liked that I saw in some textbooks was the way they were broken down into sections. So a chapter was put into more bite-sized pieces. So you could do a section typically about a day in my mind. I do one to two sections a day and the exercises that follow them you will see that a lot of times we have uh, exercises, and I think these are on the next page, um, that deal particularly with morphology, with agreement, asking students to really think through the part, the individual word, how the individual word morphs and changes before we put it together in a sentence with other words. And you see an example of this here on page 46, where we've taught the forms of the regular verb sum, and I have these um, verb charts here. This was something I actually created when I was teaching um, Latin at Grace Academy in some of my early years. I had students who were having a real problem reading sentences and it was the endings. They kept missing the endings. And I was trying to find a good way to get them to focus in on the understanding of, of looking for those words, looking at those endings and understanding what they mean. I created this chart and it helped incredibly. So this was something I put into the Latin Alive series where I'm asking them specifically to break down a verb into tense, person, number, and then think what those three things mean in terms of a meaning. 
some of the, the biggest challenges with learning Latin is to get over the culture shock that it's not English. And so whereas in English, we have a pronoun and a helping verb and an action verb. In Latin, I, I tell them it's kind of like the Happy Meal package or when you go to Sonic and you just say, I want a number one. And they know what number one is. You don't have to say it's this kind of burger with this kind of drink with this kind of side with this kind of dressings. So it's kind of this combo pack. So um, I really like to, and I find it's helpful for the students to look at individual parts and then down here, begin putting them together and understanding how these things fit together in a sentence. Okay, so that's kind of going through the grammar lessons. Um, all of these things in each chapter add up to a reading because essentially the goal of this course is to train students to read Latin. In grammar school, oftentimes you're more focused on the memorization and the chanting. In upper school, you really need to be focused on the reading. After all, that's the purpose that's what this all comes together to do. So when we created the Latin Alive series, we started by thinking about what are the readings going to look like? What is going to be in them? And then let's build our vocabulary and our grammar lessons on top of those. As I mentioned at the beginning, one of the visions or a, a real driving vision for this course was the integration of subjects in classical Christian education. And because it's Latin, uh, we ought to look at Roman history and we ought to look at Roman culture. So you will see that the Latin Alive series really goes through the chronology of the Roman Empire. In book one, we're focusing on the early, the monarchy and the early Roman Republic. In book two, we focus on the transition from Republic to Empire and really the Empire. I think our last reading, I believe, is maybe Attila the Hun. So we go pretty extensively down. So we're trying to follow this chronology. So he, um, in Latin Alive Book One, all of our readings are inspired by Livy's History of Rome. Um, when I say inspired by, I mean that we're looking at Livy's Latin work and we're looking at the stories that we have found, Galen and I have found most interesting to students and or most beneficial for them in a classical Christian setting that, because I understand having had three kids go K through 12, all of them graduated from a classical Christian school. I'm very, very happy with that. I understand what kind of books, what kind of history are going to be studied in a classical school, especially a Christ-centered classical school. And so we wanted this book to complement those studies. So here we start with Numa Pompilius, who was a very important um, king of Rome. He was the second king. Um, and while Romulus is more of one of those where um, myth, legend, history intertwine, we're not sure, Numa is more of a historical figure. Still a lot of myth and legend around him, but he's more of a historical figure. And there are important things to know about him in terms of um, establishing the Roman religion instead of even establishing the Roman calendar and, and some of the Roman laws. And so here's a reading about him. And this whole chapter, chapter seven, was designed to build up towards this reading. Um, but I also mentioned that while we wanted a parts to whole approach, we also really wanted to bring in some spoken Latin opportunities some oral opportunities. So you'll see here, over here on the right, is something called Responde Latine. Now, this was an idea that was inspired by Eke Romani. I was raised on Ginny's and Eke Romani when I studied Latin in seventh grade through, eighth, uh, through ninth grade, and then we did authentic readings after that. These questions are meant to build reading comprehension. Reading comprehension is just as important when studying a foreign language as it is when studying your own language. So it is very important here as well. These can be written exercises, but I always encourage teachers to do them orally too. Here's what I found. Um, my own experience in taking Latin 7th through 12th grade was more written, reading, paper, um, not really any speaking. And my teacher was fantastic, fantastic. I loved her. When I went to the University of Texas at Austin, I decided that I really wanted to study Italian. 
And I did so because A, I wanted to do a language that I could have a conversation in um, with, with real people, not just my fellow Latinists. And I also, my goal was to be a classical teacher. And my own Latin teacher had taken us to Italy at the end of our senior year. And that was an experience that was transformational for me. So I really wanted to be able to, and I'm pleased to say that I have now for five years, I take students over to Rome and to Florence, and I show them all the many wonderful things that we've studied in terms of art and history and literature. And we read Latin stuff, old Latin stuff, which is very exciting. Um, but as I sat in that Italian classroom, I found that I could pick up the reading and writing like that because it was so close to Latin and because Latin had so trained my reading and writing and my comprehension skills. But the oral was a struggle for me. So I really encourage people to bring in oral or spoken Latin as much as you can for a number of reasons. Um, one, it helps train that part of your brain. Two, um, as my dear Mrs. Fugate, my Latin teacher told me, the more senses you use to learn something, the better you retain it. So as both a tool for learning and as a foundation for future language study, um, please get some oral in wherever you can. And one of the things we wanted to do in Latin Alive is make it friendly, um, non-intimidating to bring in that oral Latin. One way is through that Responde Latine. Um, the next way I believe we're seeing on the next page, well, that's our Responde Latine. It's a closer look at the Responde Latine. Um, on the next page, let's see, haha, here it is. Um, this is also from chapter seven because Numa Pompilius introduced the, the Roman uh, religion system. Here we have a culture corner on the Olympians. Culture corners are something that we did quite a bit in this, um, pardon me, in this textbook because again, I think it's important to learn a language in the context of the culture and the history and the people who spoke it. Um, but we also, again, we see how relevant Latin is to our daily lives. So over here, this is one of my favorite lessons, um, the days of the week. So if we come over here, I'm trying to zoom in on it, the days of the week actually come from Latin. Um, over here on the far left, you see de solis, means day of the sun. Well, that's the sun's day, which comes to Sunday. Dies lunae was moon's day because um, lunae is moon. So moon's day became Monday. Um, Dies martis was Mars' day. That does not sound anything like Tuesday, but some of these days went through Norse mythology. So you have Tyr became Tyr's day, and that was Tuesday. So we see a really cool etymology study, but also really cool cultural development study where we see the, where the days of our week came from and why they have the names that they do. This can end up being another great opportunity to bring in spoken Latin. Every morning I ask my students um, how they're doing and I ask them what day it is today. What will it be tomorrow? What was it yesterday? Um, and, and we can bring these kind of things in. So this is another great way to engage them in learning this language, but also help these young people begin to understand the history of their modern day American culture, the history of Western civilization. All right, let's see, next page. There we go. Um, another culture corner, um, money. So this is just another example. Um, I'll to be watching for the time. I'll go ahead and kind of go through this one pretty quickly. But these are some other examples of the kinds of colloquium or the kinds of culture corner, the kinds of learning that this book seeks to engage students with. And again, it's primarily how to learn a language, but secondarily, it's wanting to integrate that idea of a study of um, classical culture ancient Roman culture and how it affects our language. Okay, and those are, those are the numbers, that's a chapter there. Okay, so now let's talk about why Latin? Why Latin in the upper school? Um, I'm gonna give you kind of the four basic reasons and then I'm gonna give you the real reason. So number one, I already said this, build your English skills. Um, then this was the, one of the reasons that my mother really, really wanted me to study the language. Did you know, let's play did you know, that 
of our English vocabulary comes from Latin. Now, if you look at words that are two syllables or more, in that category, 90%, 90% of our words that are two or more syllables come from Latin. And typically, they're the more elevated words. So whereas night comes from the German noct, um, nocturnal um, comes from the Latin word nox noctis. So that's a great reason. Um, I've had a number of students. Um, I think one of them, one of my students, her father commented to her about how excellent her vocabulary words her vocabulary was, and, she, and this was that she was a high school student. And he said, it must be because you're such an avid reader. And she said, dad, it's really because of the Latin. The Latin helps me read more and the two together, they build my vocabulary. So she had a better understanding. Create a foundation for language and science studies. Okay, so five romance languages. Romance languages are called the romance languages not because they're meant to be spoken over candlelight with a glass of wine, although there's nothing wrong with that, um, but because they all stem directly from Latin. So you have French, Portuguese, Romanian, Italian, Spanish. Those five languages come directly from the language of Rome, thus romance. So if you want to learn one of those languages, having Latin as a foundation greatly helps you and helps you see the connections between each of them. But it's also a great foundation for science. I cannot tell you how many nurses, doctors, landscape architects even, have come to me and said that either the language that was the most helpful to them was Latin, or it was the one course they wish they had taken because it would have saved them so much time and agony because the nomenclature they need to work with. Um, I actually took a botany class in, in college. Um, gardening is one of my favorite hobbies, love it. And I almost considered changing my major that semester, but I didn't, I stuck with it, but it was just, it was a great class. And um, the, the final exam was simply to walk around and as this, the professor pointed to plants, we had to write down the scientific name of the plant. Um, I don't feel like I'm bragging to tell you I aced it. I was, it's probably the only science course that I aced, to be honest. Um, and it's because it was all going back to that taxonomy. And I understood the derivation of the words. The, the words were not um, uh, nonsense. They made sense to me. Um, also law, let's talk about law for a moment. Um, one of my students um, graduated from Grace Academy, went on to Rhodes College to pursue a classics degree with the purpose of going into law school. And she, uh, because of her classical studies, and, and, and this is her saying this, not just me, her biased Latin teacher, she credits her classical language studies, the Latin and the Greek, with helping her to obtain a 99% score on the LSAT. Um, she just understood, and, and she was actually told when she asked, what are the best undergrad degrees for law school? And they said, political science and classics. Those are your two best undergrads for law school. So again, you kind of got to think outside the box for that. Significantly raise academic test scores, not just verbal scores, but even math scores. Um, and this is the reason why you see such a rise in Latin and a demand in it, even within the public schools. In fact, in the state of Texas, where I, am, where I live, um, Latin is the second most popular language foreign language to take after Spanish. And that's because of the increase in scores. Um, so again, this is kind of a means to an end type of thing. It's certainly not my favorite reason, but it's true, your, your math problem solving scores also significantly increase even over scores of any other language. Um, and there are stats and studies to, to go through that. Um, I did not bring those with me because honestly, that's a whole other presentation and I could spend an hour on it. The other thing which I hope I have demonstrated in some small degree thus far is to better understand the inheritance of Western civilization, which sadly in this modern day and age is getting a lot of pushback. But the thing is, if I want to understand who I am as a person, it's good for me to know my parents and where they came from. It's even better to know my grandparents, my great grandparents. My grandmother, um, librarian, genealogist, um, loves that study. But to see where we came from, 
that shapes a lot of who we are and what we are and how we act and how we respond. And for us to go back and look at the civilizations of um, Greece to some degree, but especially Rome, Rome, which if you look at the maps, especially in the time of, of Trajan, just covered the, almost the entire known world. And forever after was a huge influence down even past its quote fall into the um, Middle Ages, into the Renaissance. You have influential works of Latin being written by Isaac Newton in the 1700s. Um, his Principia Mathematica, which is just today still considered one of the most definitive works on mathematics, entirely published in Latin. So um, it's a part of who we are. It's a part of who America is. If you want to go back and even look at the architecture, um, go back and look at the symbols in our Supreme Courthouse and in the, 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 um, the uh, Senate House and Congress, um, all of these harken back to Rome. So a course in Latin, I've always said, is really a course in world knowledge. And I think that's what you are gifting to your students as you study this, not just a one or two year token, but as you really get into number five, studying the master of uh, the masters of literature in the original language. Classical education puts a great deal of emphasis on the great texts, on the great books. It puts a lot of em um, emphasis on recognizing masters, whether it's literature or art or rhetoric, and learning how to imitate them so that you can then aspire to their excellence. And what I would argue is, if we're going to call Virgil, Cicero, Horace, Martin Luther, um, Isaac Newton, Francis Bacon, some of the masters in their field, then why would we settle for reading an imitation in English interpretation when we have the opportunity to read the original work itself. In my mind, that's like saying, I can look at the Mona Lisa on the virtual tour on the internet. Why do I need to go to Louvre in, in France? Why can't I just look at Michelangelo's David? Let me just look at a one dimensional picture. Why do I actually need to go to Florence and walk around that massive statue of genius to really understand and appreciate it? I would argue the same thing for language. We can certainly benefit from seeing Michelangelo's David in a YouTube video. We can certainly benefit from looking at a picture of the Mona Lisa in a textbook, but how much richer is the experience when you can go there and you can study them in person? So um, that's going to be my, my last piece here. And that is the Latin Alive Reader. Certainly in 30 minutes, I could not go through the entire Latin Alive series. So I'm starting kind of with the Alpha and the Omega, if you will. I think that sounds maybe like a, maybe maybe I shouldn't borrow that phrase. But um, going to the Latin Alive Reader, which is the fourth book in the series, if you will, although it can also be a standalone to benefit any, any um, curriculum. In fact, I have good friends in public schools here in Austin who borrow sections out of it. Um, the idea with this textbook was really the long game. It was to show students how far you can go with your Latin studies, how much you can benefit, how deeply you can drink from the font. And I know that I am quickly running out of time, Joseph, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hurry. Um, so I'm just going to look at two very quickly. One here is Pro Archia from Cicero. So the very first reading in this book is from Cicero. Is backing the button? <laughs> and Cicero is actually talking in this passage about the benefits of studying ancient literature. So think about what Cicero would be calling ancient. Um, another one um, much later is St. Patrick. This is one that my students absolutely love studying. It's his confession where he talks about um, who he is, where he's from, how he was taken into captivity, and how God used that captivity to win him over, draw him back to the Lord and accomplish a great work in his life. Um, having, being able to read these in person and then discuss them, mine them for, um, for, for uh, not only the jewels of meaning, but also word choice, word arrangement, how these use language um, is, is just fantastic. And then for me, the ultimate cherry on top is that students can then go from that to read authentic texts. This is a folio, a page 
from a 10th century manuscript called the Vitae Sanctorum Mensis Martii, in which you see the Confession of St. Patrick. And I'm able to take my students to this and read through this manuscript, thousands of years old, um, more than a thousand years old, I should say, more than a thousand years old. And when they can do this, there's just something amazing that transforms within them, the idea of, I know this language, the extent that I can read history with it. And, and that is just something um, I think of intrinsic beauty and value um, for, for any classical student, for any lifelong learner. Um, so I, I could go on for another half an hour easily, but I see that we are, I've already gone longer than I told Joseph I would. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop my share, Joseph, and turn it over to you. And my apologies for, for going long. It's hard for me to stop once I get started. I think that there's, I speak for a number of people here when I say that we could listen to you talk for a lot longer than this. <laughs> Be careful what you ask for. <laughs> Um, uh, I'm going to turn it back over to you in a second. Uh, I'm just going to facilitate some questions. And when we've had a few great ones uh, come over, um, both before the webinar and during the webinar, and I want to get to as many of these as we can. Uh, again, another quick reminder to everyone, if we're not able to cover your specific question during the webinar, uh, you can shoot an email to info at classicalsubjects.com with your question and we will uh, take a look at it and get back to you. And uh, you can also reach out to us over social media with your question as well. Uh, uh, first one I wanted to mention, it's hard picking out the first question to give you because uh, th there's so many good ones. And I will also note that, that we're planning on extending our time together today a little past an hour, we'll probably go to about 4.15, so another half an hour. Uh, if you need to drop out at any point, um, and, and you're worried about missing some of the questions, don't worry. Uh, we are recording this webinar and all registrants will get a copy of the recording. Um, I believe we'll be able to get that to you by the end of the week, if not sooner. Um, and the recording will also be available on YouTube uh, as well here in the coming days. Um, but without further ado, our, our first question. Um, the question for teachers. Um, how can teachers help students who are stepping into Latin Alive, not only with, with little Latin experience, but also with, with little classical uh, training? Um, and that's a lack of classical training, maybe for the student and also for the teacher. Um, okay. where, where does that, um, and how can that gap be bridged? Um, when we say, wow, we, we really have a love and excitement for Latin, um, but if the student and or the teacher doesn't have a lot of classical training in addition to a lot of Latin experience. Um, how can that be overcome? Great question. And I think that's a very common one because there's something about Latin like physics, um, like biochemistry, that it just has a little bit of an intimidation factor um, by it. And I, I don't think it needs to be that way. So when we created the Latin Alive series, what Gail and I wanted to do knowing that those who use this textbook would be both the experienced and the novice. Um, and we wanted this to be able to be easily used by anyone. So especially within the teacher's edition and within the student text also, we try to put as much in there as possible. There are some Latin textbooks that they're assuming you have um, a person with a classical degree or extensive background in classical language um, and they don't put everything in that book. There, some of them don't even, don't even have an answer key. Um, we wanted to get as much information in there. So I would say for the novice, um, what is it? Uh, see what Galen used to always say to me, um, well begun, no, it's, it's half done is well begun or something. Well, well begun is half done, that's what he said. Sorry, it took me a little bit. Um, well begun is half done. In other words, just get started and don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Get started, take it slow, go at whatever pace you need to. And then as the student um, is showing more comfortable, um, themselves more comfortable, more confident, then just, you know, encourage to, to, try, to turn it up. You know, the mind is a muscle. The ancients used to think of it as a muscle. In fact, the, the Latin idiom for remembering something is teneo memoria. I hold it with my memory, not in my memory, like it's a receptacle, but with my memory, 
Well, if your coach is trying to build muscles, what do they do? They start, especially with somebody like me, who's just a weakling or has lots of injuries. Um, they start slow, they start steady, and they build as you build. So that would be what I would say. Now, um, that there's a different answer for that if you're talking about someone who's coming into a new class um, where the student, other students know more than, than they do. So let me talk about that a minute, because for those of you who are in a, um, a brick and mortar school or a co-op, that often happens as well. And, and, and for us as well, we have students in our Latin Alive One class that have completed the Latin for Children series. We have students in our Latin Alive class that are brand new to Latin. And um, in that case, when you have multiple students, I would always say, again, um, the nice thing about Latin Alive is that we put more in there than you're ever going to finish in a year. And for some of you, you just went, what? And I get that question. Do you really do all of this? No, there are a lot of things in there. There's enough in there that you can have your students who have a concept cemented, you can let them be challenged, where you can spend slower time, less time, um, not less time, slower, more intentional time on the student who has less understanding. Um, and I've done that before too, where perhaps I've even said, okay, um, Billy, you're not gonna do the reading this week. I wanna go back over these sentences with you while the rest of the class is working on the reading or there was a culture corner activity. Um, Johnny, I see you're already done with the lesson. Wow, great job. I'm glad you have this so well. Go ahead and do the culture corner. That's a bonus of the activity for you because you did such a great job getting done. So consider that pacing um, can happen even within a classroom as well. It's a bit of a juggling act on the, on the part of the teacher, to be honest, because you have to be sensitive to um, observant of where your students are, but it can be done. I, I hope that answered. If it doesn't, please, please write back for clarification. Thank you, Karen. Uh, next question is, is one we've gotten multiple times. Um, and I know what your answer is going to be to this, and I'm looking forward to hearing your answer <laughs> to this. Uh, but what are your thoughts on learning two languages simultaneously? Oh, uh, mm. learning Latin in addition to French or in addition to Spanish uh, or German, uh, some okay. of those languages that didn't make the cut when you were younger. Um, I know. Well, okay. So you're talking to someone right now who is continually um, learning more Latin, more Greek and studying Italian. So, and I still speak English pretty well. So it can be done, it can be done, but you want to set your pacing differently and you want to adjust um, perhaps your expectations for deadlines because if you're using two languages at once, then you may be going a little bit slower. It may take you longer because you're juggling the two. I remember um, at UT and taking Italian and I was in a one-on-one -on -one with a professor who asked me to start counting in Latin. It was a Latin teaching methods course. And I start going um, un, due, tre, quattro, uh, cinque. And, and he just looks at me and I suddenly realized I was counting in Italian. So um, just understand you're gonna have moments like that. And that's not a bad moment either. That's a moment where your student is becoming multilingual and they're just, they're having trouble sorting it out, but they're becoming multilingual. And that's actually pretty cool. So go for it, just, Carefully set your expectations and um, your self-imposed deadlines, I would say, for, for where you need to be when, because you'll, you'll just go a little bit slower. Was that what you expected, Joseph? That was about what I expected. <laughs> thanks for, thanks for uh, following through. Okay. Uh, this one, this next question is probably even more popular, if not the most popular. It is the ever-present question of, I want to transition. And we love getting that question because it means that um, people are falling in love with Latin Alive. They're just not exactly sure how to make uh, the step over. And usually that step is coming from um, Henley. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we also have had a number of questions about uh, first form and, and making the step over from Memorial Press first form or from Henley into Latin Alive. So can you, can you, um, Hone in on those two particular uh, books and, and what would you say to educators who are looking to transition their child from 
Henley or from first form um, into yeah. Latin V? It's a great question. Um, the nice thing is that it's not like you're asking me how to translation from Japanese into Latin, right? So you're, you're coming from one kind of apple into perhaps another kind of, of apple, um, maybe one that just works better for you. And, um, you know, Henley is a, is a very good curriculum. Um, I happen to like Latin Alive better, but, um, you know, different students learn better with different styles and different, different curriculum, different methods. So um, that's, a, that's a good thing as a teacher, as a parent to be aware of. It's what's the best fit for us and for our family and for my student. So whenever I get this question, and I have had it quite often myself too, um, from all sorts of different curricula, my recommendation is go look at the table of contents. Go look at the table of contents for Henley, first form, because that's what I would do right now. And I have those books in here someplace. I would just, I'd have to dig them up. Um, and see, where is your child completely confident? Not just how many chapters have you gone through, because sometimes the last one's just kind of, eh, not, not quite solid. Where are they solid? And then find about that place within the Latin Alive series and start about there, but go slow and realize, the nice thing is, is that most books, not all, but most books are going in the same general sequence, right? First conjugation before second, before third, before fourth. Um, and same thing with declensions. Subjunctive comes all the way at the end. Um, the, the, the major uh, conditional clauses, those things are, are more towards the end. So most follow the same general sequence. So if you go by the table of contents, that's usually a pretty good guide. Perfect. Thank you. And uh, before we conclude, I, I'll point everyone to a resource on our site that compares uh, Latin Alive with Henley, and also with Wheelock's Latin, and then show you how you can access that resource. We talked about it a little bit in the chat box, so some of you may have seen it and already uh, taken a visit to that link and checked it out, um, but we'll make sure that, that we review that resource um, before we conclude our time uh, together today. Uh, next question for you. Now, this was uh, a popular one during our session today. I think that you excited a lot of people because of a, a number of guests asking, uh, how can I get more practice aligned with this uh, material okay. um, for the chapters? What supplementary material can I bring in to really um, make Latin alive come even more alive? Um, so, so I'd ask you that, but then, and because of where we're at in the year right now, I, I think we could also dovetail that and, and bring in the question of what can I be doing during the summer? So could yeah. you cover supplementary um, material, um, more practice, what can educators be doing and also particularly during the summer months? Sure. Um, one of the things I always recommend to my students during the summer months, and I'll do this first and I'll go back because it can sometimes apply to during the year too, depending upon your classroom or your home setup. And that is um, read, 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 read right? Read, 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 read. And you don't just have to be reading this stuff in the Latin Alive textbook. Certainly those are there, read them. But um, the Libellus del Historia series, even though it's grammar school, I would say especially the Primer C book, there, it's, it's great to go back and read something that's a little bit easier for you because it's still practicing that vocabulary recognition, the um, grammar recognition, all of those things. So read stories. There are also no shortage of Latin novellas out there um, that can be a lot of fun to read. Um, one of my favorite gifts from my dear sweet grandmother when I was in high school was Winnie Ile Pooh, and um, it, which was Winnie the Pooh in Latin. And in my ninth grade year of high school, I couldn't read the whole thing, but there were different snippets, different sections um, that I could read from there. Um, and, and there are so many different works that have been translated. Um, so I would, I would encourage you to do that too. And that also, honestly, especially in the summer, it feels a little bit less like classwork and more like enjoyment. So try to find a Latin reader, Latin novella that's on, like either on or slightly below your current Latin reading level and just do that practice. Also, I'll give a shout out to CAP, Classical Academic Press, who has done a fantastic job with online support resources. Um, there's the Latin Flash Dash is out there. There was also a game show quiz. And I'll let one of our CAP staff tell you how to get in touch with those because um, 
that's something else that I recommend. They'll, they'll have better, more accurate information than I will, and I'm afraid I would botch it. Um, but I often um, recommend those to, um, to our students. Um, another great summer activity, there's a program called Picta Dicta by my friend and colleague, Tim Griffith, who um, does a great job and it's all online, all self-check. So that's another great place to do vocabulary building and practice over the summer. Um, now in terms of the Latin Alive book itself, um, there's a, a great number of exercises in there to do. There are also suggested exercises. One that I enjoy doing in my classroom is creative composition, um, in which I ask students to start making up uh, their own silly sentences. And I tell them, I mean, it can be like a Dr. Seuss sentence where you have three fish in a tree. How can that be? Makes no sense in terms of reality, but it's grammatically correct. So, um, Composition is something that my students really enjoy doing. And it can start out as being something very simple. Um, one exercise is um, just to have everybody tell me about yourself. Tell me who you are, who your parents are. Um, tell me about your dog. Um, in one, uh, one class activity, um, students were to draw a map of their home and their yard and then to start describing that in some short Latin sentences. And it can be cluttered and messy at first. That's how we start um, our writing, but we're starting to process, get that out, and then we refine it. So composition is another thing that my students really enjoy um, that I think is a, is a wonderful way to practice Latin. Thank you, Karen. And uh, in terms of that particular question, uh, we also have um, a blog from Karen that I think dates back to 2017 or 16. Yes. That's uh, a great piece on um, summer Latin practice ideas. Yes. And I will, uh, I will show that before we conclude our time together as well. And that blog also, Joseph, has a lot of games and activities mm -hmm. on it too. So um, there's lots of different ideas from my, my toolbox. Right, and that's what we're, we're beginning to see, and I love that, is that it really is a toolbox. You can't really get boxed in with this. Um, there's yeah. always avenues to learn. Right, uh, moving on, back, shifting back to the program uh, a little bit, um, I'm gonna talk about the video that's included with our Latin Alive Book One, Two, and Three program. Um, each program comes with a student edition, a teacher's edition, and this teaching video. So Karen, what can you tell us about the Latin Alive teaching video um, why does this particular video uh, help set the Latin Alive programs apart from other options? What can okay. people expect from the video? Well, this goes back to Classical Academic Press and their vision for how best they can come alongside, partner with parents and teachers um, for teaching their students in all sorts of different subject areas. And they really like to have these instructional videos as an optional tool for everyone. So with the Latin Alive video, um, that is actually me. Um, coming into your home while you're sitting comfortably on your sofa, or I also know the teachers who've used it in the classroom, especially um, hint when you're out and you have a sub. It can also be very helpful. Um, but it's me actually walking through the lesson. You will see me teaching the concept. You will even see me walking through some exercises. I even do some of the colloquial more exercises that ask things like quo in tempore est, um, in what tense is it, right? Or cuius es generis, um, in what gender is it? And, and some of the oral conversations, oral exercises I do in Latin. So um, I think it can be very helpful from that point, especially for the novice teacher who's feeling a little bit um, intimidated and, un and unsure, or also the mom who's juggling lots of different kids at lots of different levels, it can help. Um, the one thing I would caution against is um, even though I think I'm a pretty good teacher, I wouldn't just plug it in and walk away. I think it's essential to be partnering with your student, with your child as they learn this language. Um, even if you're not mastering it alongside them, that you're hearing the lesson as well. Um, if, if nothing else, it helps you kind of redirect them when they have questions or want to review something. Thank you, Karen. Uh, next question. Uh, we're wrapping up here in about 10, 12 minutes. So I'll try to get us through a couple more and we've got some more good ones. Um, 
What do we do when Latin Alive gets overwhelming or feels overwhelming? Um, particularly, we had, we had one guest of us today say that grading can often feel overwhelming, um, especially when we're getting into grading each exercise in each chapter. So could you address that specifically, um, the overwhelming nature of grading, but also just in general, when, when we're dealing with something like Latin that, that often for educators has an overwhelming nature surrounding it, um, how can we successfully combat that? Sure, I think that is a fantastic question, uh, particularly about the grading, I love that, because I think all too often, we as teachers, we as students, um, allow the grade to drive us and to consume us and to overwhelm us. And what we need to do is take a step back and remember that the grade is simply an indicator of where you are in terms of mastery. Um, it is not a value assessment. Um, so if we take some of that pressure off of the grade, and I've given lectures on the purpose and meaning of grades, so I could go into that whole thing for an hour to the history and where it came from, if we take the weight, that weight off of what a grade means, um, we need to think of it more as a tool as opposed to a goal. So it's a tool, it's feedback. So then what are different ways that I can give feedback in a way that blesses my students and allows me to keep my joy and my sanity? Because that's really important. And I've had the homeschool situation where I'm one-on-one, -on -one, two two-on-one, I've had the public school um, situation where I had 30 on one. So I definitely understand um, the different dynamics in, in that. So to go back to the, the pragmatic answer, um, one thing I would encourage you to feel is like you don't, not necessarily everything needs to be for a grade. Um, in our school, we look at 10 grades in a class per quarter. That's about one grade per week. Um, Everything else is leading up towards that understanding. So in one respect, you can pick and choose those assignments that you feel best assess that benchmark of how well are you doing? Where are you? And those can be your grades. Another thing I encourage teachers to do because I find not only does it help me in my grading um, management, but it also helps students in their learning is to have the students become partners in grading. So what do I mean by that? Um, a student has completed their assignment. Students have completed their assignment. Um, instead of having them turn it in and I mark it up with my colored pen and hand it back to them and they don't even look at it. It goes right in the binder or even worse in the trash can. And they don't look at all the wisdom I just poured into that page. Um, what I tend to do is as students bring their work back, I say, okay, everybody put away your pens and pencils and I want a pen of another color. It can be red, it can be pink, it can be green, as long as it's not blue or black. Because, and I look to make sure that's what everybody has in their hands. There's no temptation to quickly write in something else when all you have at your fingertips is a colored device. And then we go through the exercise together and I spend a class period checking. And oh my goodness, then I don't get through another exercise that day. But it's more important that I make sure the last lesson was fully learned, well soaked in, and that they understand what they did wrong. Because a mistake can be incredibly valuable if you understand what you did wrong and how to avoid it in the future. And so I take the, that in-class together grading time as a good teaching time to walk through what did we get right? What did we get wrong? Why? How do we get better? Mm -hmm. And then maybe that I haven't passed it all up and I can then record the grades as fit or sometimes I do check plus completion depending upon what the assignment is. But don't feel, I see so many teachers, I've been an upper school teacher, a teacher mentor for many years as well. I see so many teachers get burned out over the grading. Um, don't, don't breathe. Not everything has to have a percentage mark on it. I'm sure that's a relief. Uh, for some <laughs> here. Thank you for going into detail on that. Uh, I really want to get to this question. I thought it was a great one. Uh, I'll, I'll read it verbatim because it's a little bit longer. Okay. It's posed to us. Um, 
by Charlotte T. Thank you, Charlotte, for this question. She asked, when teaching Latin for children, not Latin live, but Latin for children, when teaching Latin for children in the grammar level, I tell the parents who are teaching the class to focus on the vocabulary and the chants. I'll say, go ahead and teach the grammar content, but not to worry if they don't really, quote, get it, because that can be hard for young minds, which are so concrete. What I tell them is that when they get to the logic level, seventh grade plus, they will be more prepared mentally and able to fully engage and quote, get it better by then. I want the kids to love the language and not be turned off from it before they are really ready to engage at a deeper level. Do you agree with this approach? I think that's a fair response. I think every classroom is going to be different. Um, here's what I would say. I'm going to, I'm going to massage at Charlotte and modify it just a little bit. I think you're right in that um, the vocabulary and charts is, tends to be the focus in grammar school. They're little sponge, they can soak it up. I would say they don't need to be able to articulate to you genitive of possession, genitive of origin, genitive of blah, 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 blah. At the same time, you do want them to be able to apply that, those vocabulary and charts to reading. I think it's very important to start even simple reading in the grammar school. Think about a woodshop class. I would not say here's a hammer and here's a nail and let's look at all the hammers and nails and never build anything with it. And I'm not saying it's what you're saying, Charlotte. I just wanna clarify in that, in that statement. Um, and the reading can also reinforce some of those grammar things, even in an intuitive, more subconscious way. And then Charlotte, you're right. In the logic school, they're gonna go back over these things they're gonna go deeper, they're gonna to go to a, a deeper level. And I've told my students to use means of encouragement. There were some things that I know I heard in my seventh, eighth grade class. I know I heard it in my high school class. I know I heard it in my college class. When I was teaching and reading more and more and more, it was finally like, oh, the light bulb went on. That's the way humans are made. We're not gonna always get things at the first pass. So you're absolutely right. You want to emphasize the joy and the love of learning. You want to heap encouragement and praise, but do, do continue to take that vocabulary and chant and apply them into the reading, even if they don't understand the grammar labels. Help them understand in, um, as they're reading how those form a thought. Beautiful. Thank you, Karen, and thank you, Charlotte, for posing that question. Speaking of that, um, Joseph, can I jump in with one that I saw? Um, there were two that kind of dovetailed on each other. One was about, um, is there an LA4? Uh, yes and no. There's not a Latin Alive 4, but it's a Latin Alive reader. And someone else asked about the sequence of that reader. I've had that question many times too. There's not necessarily a sequence. I want you to think of the Latin Alive reader as the buffet table at a grand feast and you decide where you want to go and what you want to eat. And if the pork chops are calling you, go with the pork chops. If it's the um, chocolate mousse, that's what's calling me, um, go with the chocolate mousse. But it's just, we put it in chronologically, but even throughout there, the reading levels are different. So look in there at to what you think would um, benefit your class, your students the best and then um, look and see how well that fits in. But there's, there's not a sequence for the reader. Great, thank you. Uh, we're approaching 4.15, so uh, I'm going to uh, segue us into uh, our farewell today. Thank you everyone who has stuck around for Q&A and asked some really intuitive questions. Uh, and forced Karen to speak a little bit more, which we wanted and which we got. And I was very thankful for that. Uh, I'm going to share my screen quickly uh, and hop into a brief review of resources for you all. Uh, starting with uh, our site, quickly, classicalacademicpress.com, for those who aren't familiar with us. You can learn more about us and about classical education via this drop down. Our story here, more about classical education here um, and our team who we're associated with, as well as, again, if you have another question that you want to ask via email, social media, or even over the phone, um, ways to contact us uh, right here. 
Um, another drop down, you'll see our resources. This is where you can find um, information on the Latin Alive series. If you go to product lines, you'll see all our products here. The ones we're focused on today is Latin Alive. Um, but you also see Latin for children here, Latin for teachers, and our first through third grade text song school Latin here. But clicking on Latin Alive, this will bring up the collection um, for all three books, Latin Alive 1, 2, and 3, and the Latin Alive Reader or um, also known as Latin Alive 4. Uh, the book one program, once you're on the program page or the book page, um, a couple things that I wanna point out. The first is our, our PDF reader or look inside feature. On every program product page, you'll see an image um, on the upper left side of the uh, page. And clicking on that image will open up a uh, PDF reader. Now, I'm using Safari right now and uh, as you can see, it's not opening up right away. It's a good illustration of why not to use Safari when you're trying to look at our samples. Works much better on Firefox and Chrome. Uh, so just a little note there. Um, that is a, a great benefit. Um, like Karen said, it's so important to review the chapters uh, and, and we give you the ability to, to look inside and um, review a couple of the lessons and also see the layout of each book. Um, so definitely a feature to take advantage of as well as our support tab. If you scroll further down the page, you'll see the support tab down here. You can find a list of uh, resources on the support tab, uh, including the errata and the comparison uh, with Wheelox Latin that I mentioned earlier, as well as a declension and conjugation worksheet and key and syllabication and accent PDF as well. So some great resources and the place to find them is the support tab on the page. This is specifically Latin Alive 1 here um, but also available for, Latin, for, for the other books in the series. Our FAQ page, Access Under Resources, you can see it right here. On that FAQ page, you'll find a lot of common questions, some that we covered today about Latin Alive. One that I want to point out in particular is Henley. How does Latin Alive compare with Henley Latin? If you go here, um, you will be able to find our PDF spreadsheet um, with the chapter by chapter comparison on Latin Alive and Henley. Um, and also this blog post, one of our most commonly viewed blog posts, switching from Henley to Latin Alive. Um, this is a letter from a co-op leader. Um, so both are accessible pretty easily through our FAQ page right here. Uh, we talked briefly about School A Academy in the chat box. I wanted to show you this as well. Um, for anyone interested in online courses, um, that use the Latin Alive text, Scola Academy offers them quite a number actually. Um, so if you go to scolaacademy.com, this is what the homepage looks like. Explore all courses. You see lower school options here, middle school options. Um, we get into upper school. So you'll see our middle school, Latin options, Latin for children, C, spoken Latin. Latin 1 utilizes the Latin Alive Book 1. Latin 2 utilizes Latin Alive Book 2. And then the upper school, a um, number of Latin courses, options as well. Um, Latin Alive 3, Intermediate Latin, Advanced Latin there. And each page um, has the details that you need, um, including information on the course text, a full description of the course, and a step-by-step -step checklist for getting started with the course. So that's a little bit more of a background about Scola Academy, scolaacademy.com uh, for learning more about uh, having Latin Alive taught by um, master teachers. They, they do an incredible job teaching this course and we're thrilled with the educators that we have teaching Latin Alive through Scola Academy. And finally, as mentioned, Summer Latin Practice Ideas by the one and only Karen Moore. This is accessible through our blog. Um, if you visit our site, you see the black bar at the top, the education blog, it's called Insights. You can find a number of blogs actually on not only Latin Alive, um, but Latin education, Latin for children. Um, and then this one, it does date back to 2016, but it's a great read, Summer Latin Practice Ideas by Karen. Um, so with that, I will wrap up our time today. Thank you to everyone for tuning in. Again, I know I mentioned this before, but we will have a recording uh, if you'd like to share it, feel free. We want to get this resource out to as many people as possible uh, and have them be able to soak in 
uh, the words of care and what we learned today on the review of Latin Alive and, and getting to know upper school Latin on a deeper level. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining us. Um, this webinar is part of a larger series we're doing this summer called the Subject Spotlight, the CAP Subject Spotlight. Um, the last two weeks were dedicated to writing and rhetoric. Um, this two week stretch is dedicated to Latin Alive and Upper School Latin. Uh, and coming up next, we have Logic and Rhetoric. So our next webinar, uh, two weeks, uh, in two weeks, July 9th, will be on Logic and Rhetoric. And as I mentioned before, we'll be having a webinar on Lower School Latin with Dr. Christopher Perrin coming up in August. So I hope to see you all back for another webinar. Uh, have a blessed Wednesday uh, and a great week for all the Classical Academic Press team and for Karen. Uh, we'll sign off now. Thanks for joining us today.